Hello, this is Dr. Mike, and welcome to Communications 112 for Valley College. Uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be discussing some very vital things for your career and your future. And I hope that you will find uh, the, the lectures helpful that go along with the book and try to, you know, the purpose of the lectures are to get you started uh, in thinking about whatever's in the chapter. We cover four chapters per week. And so there'll be four lectures per week. It will cover each chapter. And I'll do my best to try to, uh, you know, elucidate the things that will be most important to you. I've had quite experience working in the business world. I have worked for three of the largest uh, companies in the world, actually, and international companies as well. And one of the things that I have concluded after all of those years of labor is that there are certain things about the, the business communications that are vital to success. And of course, you want to be successful. We often hear the words professionalism. And so, you know, that's kind of wrapped up in this. Uh, as a Southerner, I come from the backwoods of South Carolina, where I jokingly say that we had to pipe sunlight in every day. Uh, I always have an accent and I have, a, you know, talk a certain, speak a certain way. And so I've spent my life trying to learn to not, the, you know, in formal communications and in writing uh, in the business world to play down those things that would uh, cause us problems to not be considered to be professionals. People judge you based upon how you speak and how you write. And that includes emails and everything that goes along with that. So we'll be discussing a lot of those things over the next three weeks as to how you could put your best foot forward. Now, some people reject that idea. They work against it and they usually work against it to their own detriment because they end up having, uh, you know, not having the same success as they, other people do who really work at it. The purpose of having an education is that you use the education uh, to better your lot in life, to do a good job and to be what other people would expect you to be. So uh, think about those things as we uh, go through this presentation and uh, look at some, some ideas. First of all, let me uh, talk to you about the, just some general things and, and talk about how important business skills are and how they will improve your career prospects and help you succeed in to today's challenging digital age workplace. One of the worst mistakes that you can make as a professional is to reject the, the idea that, uh, that, that things are moving at the rate that they are. Uh, you don't do things today the way you did them 10 years ago or even five years ago or even one year ago. We've recently had some uh, major hiccups in the business world due to a pandemic, and that has changed the way that we work. Many of us now work from home where we used, we used to have an office and a place to work, and some people aren't able to work at all. So let me say to you that communication skills in this complex networked world are even more important today than they were even a year ago. And being able to communicate is a hot commodity now more than ever. Uh, and it's a learned ability. It is not inborn. You're not born a good communicator or a bad communicator. Uh, you learn to be a good communicator. And communication skills are gonna be your ticket, especially in this day. Uh, in this digital world where we're able to work at home, we're able to do almost anything from home. It's vitally important that we, uh, that we understand that. And I want to encourage you during this class to think about uh, how you can improve your professional skills, make yourself more marketable, and uh, make someone want to hire you. Uh, so communication skills have changed, as I've said. We have Traditional abilities used to be reading and listening and nonverbal skills, speaking and writing, but there's some new requirements today. You've got to be media savvy. Uh, you're careful about uh, things that you put out there in the media. Most people resist the fact that uh, people looking for to hire people now look at their Facebook account to see what you really are like, to see what your politics are, to see what your religious views are, to see what you're putting online. Uh, because it's a mark of good judgment, uh, and it's a, it says something about your judgment if you if you place these things in your Facebook account or your Twitter account or whatever. You want to maintain a positive image and a positive presence in today's digital world because 
you are part of the employer's reputation and you certainly want to protect that reputation. In this digital revolution that we're in, and you think about this, 20 years ago, we couldn't even do a Zoom like we're doing right now, or we wouldn't have had the same uh, access to emails and all the things that we have in the world. So it is a revolution. I'm not the generation that would be normally doing a lot of things with computers. And uh, to be honest with you, what I know about computers, I've had to you know, bang my head against the wall to learn. When I walk through the doors of a BMW, one of my international companies that I worked with for 10 years, I got my comeuppance immediately with Microsoft Office. And uh, it really jerked me kicking and screaming into the 21st century. And that's exactly what BMW did to my region of the country. We had to step up and to be better and to do better. Uh, today, writing matters more than ever uh, because online media requires that you write more, not less. I mean, I remember when computers first came out, I put the first computer lab in a school in my county in 1985, and they said it'll be the end of paper as we know it. Well, we know that hasn't happened, uh, but we also know that messages now are much more instant, and anything that you write or you put out on the World Wide Web uh, and on the internet is going to be there forever. Somebody can always find that. Messages travel instantly to distant locations, to large audiences, and uh, you work in teams in the average uh, company now, and you collaborate even when you're physically apart. You're able now to work from home, get your team together, have a meeting just like we, we do with classes sometimes. Social media is playing an increasingly more prominent role in business. Who would have thought that we would have had a president who basically communicated through tweets to his uh, followers? Uh, we make life-changing critical judgments about people based upon their writing and their ability. Let's face it, we're not in a person-to-person -person contact anymore, so we don't have the value of body language or facial expressions or sometimes even tones, but we we still make the same uh, judgments. Uh, to succeed, uh, uh, J. Willard Marriott, who is head of Marriott Corporation, said to succeed in today's workplace, young people need more than just basic reading and math skills. They need substantial content knowledge and information technology skills, advanced thinking skills, flexibility to adapt to change, and interpersonal skills to succeed in a multicultural cross-functional team. So basically that's what you are trying to get as you go to school. Uh, there's probably no, there's no way today for you to learn everything that you need to learn in school while you're here for four years or whatever, but you do learn to, where to find answers. It's not so much now about knowing everything as it is being really adept, adept at uh, finding the answers that you need. So basically, the digital revolution affects you. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. Uh, you can't even work at McDonald's now without some computer knowledge or, or Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, you know, if you're there selling plants at Lowe's, you've got to have computer knowledge to do reorders and to do all kinds of things. But even technical skills require that you communicate. Business skills use a variety of media and messages and professional business-like writing is in your future if you're going to succeed uh, or you'll end up you know, not even being able to get a decent job. These are the skills that employers tell us that they want. Excellent oral written communication skills, uh, the ability to work in teams, unblemished social media presence. There again, there's Facebook and all those things, professionalism and work ethic, and then critical thinking and analytical reasoning. These are all very weighty terms that we need to talk about if you're going to be professional, uh, especially if you're going to be the face of a company. Uh, you know, you can't even get a customer service job now without these skills because you are the first person that customers see when they come through the door of an organization and uh, they're vitally, con in, and the employer is vitally concerned that you look the part, that you sound the part. Uh, you know, you, you even online businesses, if you're doing call centers, uh, they now look for people without accents. The number one state in the union where they uh, will, will look for call center people are Utah, because Utah apparently has the least accent of any section 
of the country, and they don't want you readily identifiable as a Southerner, Northerner, West Virginian, South Carolina, whatever. So your education is going to drive your income for the rest of your life. And there are a lot of advantages to a college education. Uh, you get higher lifetime earnings, uh, less unemployment, wider variety of career options, and of course, access to the highest paying, fastest growing careers. So basically, you need to look at your education as a path to a career and not just another job. There are a lot of cha challenges in this information age. You can stand on the sidelines and wait for it to go away and think, well, I'll, I'll catch up one day, but you just have to dive in and go with it uh, because you, you've got to be current. Uh, we've got rapidly changing communication technologies, and this is probably one of the things that's most baffling. You can buy a new computer, and within six months, that computer's outdated, obsolete, because we're so quickly adapting new things uh, to how we operate. Uh, Self-directed work groups and virtual teams. If you've never worked on a team, you're missing a lot of fun. Uh, usually, you know, we always said that BMW, there's no I in team, but there always is an I. There's someone who's trying to get to the top and doing what they can do to get there. Uh, growing workforce diversity. If you can't work around people of other religions, other creeds, other cultures, other skin colors, other languages, and you're going to have a problem in today's very diverse world. Uh, there's a heightened global competition. We now deal with people in China and Japan and all the other countries of the world, uh, and you have offices that are not territorial anymore. They are anywhere, anytime, because you now have your home has become part of your office and your uh, message system on your phone has become part of your office. And we don't longer have these hierarchical management positions uh, and we have renewed emphasis on ethics and right doing. So you'll be able to take courses in that. Uh, here at Valley College, I teach the ethics classes usually uh, where you learn how to do right. Um, so basically we need to confront these barriers to effective listening and start building your listening skills. That's the second learning objective. And I think it's something that's that's worth our thinking about and our doing. Uh, listening is career critical. Uh, many of us are poor listeners. Poor listening skills will affect your personal relationships. We listen. And if you're married, you probably have said this before, that your partner just doesn't listen. We actually listen only about 25 to 50% of the time. And costly errors may come from just poor listening skills. Uh, there are a lot of barriers to that. Uh, it can be, you know, psychological barriers. You can have people that fake attention. Uh, people just don't think as fast as others. There may be a language difference. Uh, there's a lot of nonverbal distractions maybe going on. Uh, a lot of physical barriers that may be part of that. So let's think about this morning, 10 skills to building powerful listening skills. Number one, stop talking. That is a major problem. Some people cannot stop talking long enough to listen. You cannot talk and listen at the same time. Uh, control external and internal distractions. Turn off the radio, turn off the outside distractions. Uh, one of the things that you don't want to do if you're in an online meeting is have your kids running through the room or your husband, you know, coming out of the bathroom without his clothes on. Believe me, I've had all these things happen. As a teacher, be receptive, keep an open mind. Uh, listen for the main points. You're taking notes. That's one great way to stay awake in a meeting, by the way, is to take notes. Uh, you know, capitalize on any lag time that there is. You know, listen between the lines. What is this person actually really saying? Uh, try to judge a person's ideas and not their appearances. Uh, don't interrupt. Take selective notes and avoid, you know, provide feedback and confirmation. At the end, if there's something you don't understand, ask questions and, and clarify it, please. All right. The third learning objective is to explain the importance of nonverbal communication and improve those nonverbal skills. Um, they can carry some powerful meaning. Uh, there are unwritten, unspoken messages in a meeting. Both some are intentional, some are unintentional. 
and nonverbal cues can speak sometimes louder than words. So here are nonverbal behaviors that send messages, eye contact. If you can't make eye contact with a person, this is especially true in doing job interviews, then the, the interviewer, the person speaking will uh, think you've got something you're hiding. Facial expressions, you need to look attentive. You don't need to look bored. Uh, posture, gestures, the way you sit in a chair, you need to be centered on your on your screen. You need to leave your video on if you're doing uh, meetings. Uh, those are important. You know, time, space, territory is important. I appeal of the business documents that you send. How something looks is 90% of the game. And of course, then your personal appearance will uh, be equally as important. One of the things we need to think about, even when we're doing Zoom meetings and business meetings or Zoom interviews is how you look, how you dress. You need to get up in the morning, even though you're working from home, take your shower, comb your hair, dress up like you're going to a job. Uh, the worst thing I can think about is a person that comes to a meeting in their pajamas or want to lounge on the couch with a blanket. That'd be nice. That is not professional. Uh, I, I had a student when I was doing traditional classes who literally came to school in her bunny slippers and her robe with curlers in her hair every day. Uh, ridiculous. You don't want, you want people to take you seriously. And that's going to be the image that you are going to show for the, they're going to remember for the rest of their life. So to build strong nonverbals, establish and maintain eye contact, use posture that shows you're interested, usually sitting slightly uh, leaning forward is that is important. Uh, get rid of physical barriers if they're uh, things that will hurt, improve your decoding skills as far as understanding, and then ask for more information. Uh, look at nonverbals in the context of the meeting and what's going on. Uh, associate with people from different cultures. Uh, do not discount the person that may be different, may have a different religion. Or you've got a lady in your office that wears the hajib, the hair, the head covering for the that the Muslim ladies will wear. Don't discount her. Pull her into the group. Make her feel welcome. Uh, make sure you. This is a part of team building that everyone is welcome. Appreciate the power of appearance. Look at yourself on a video just to see do what I want. If I owned a company, would I want myself to be the face of that company and get families and friends to pay attention to that as well? Fourth learning objective, explain five common dimensions of culture, understand how culture affects communication and the use of social media and communication technologies. The definition of culture is a complex system of values, traits, morals, and customs that we share uh, as a society, as a region, as a country. It's a powerful moving force that molds the way that we think, we behave, we communicate. And whether you believe it or not, you have a culture. And your culture is just as difficult to learn or get used to by someone from another culture as you have in getting used to theirs. Uh, being an American, does not make us superior to everybody else in the world. Our way is not always the best way, and that attitude is not something that will help you to grow uh, and to improve your standing in a company. Low context cultures, as opposed to high context. Uh, the low context, you know, I'm gonna let you read most of these in the text, but they tend to be logical, linear, and action oriented. Uh, high context is relational, you know, intuitive, contemplative, you think about things, you, you appreciate, you know, explicit messages. Um, you know, individualism and collectivism is another of these uh, cultures that you want to think about. What's on the low end, what's on the high end? Time orientation. Uh, time is precious. Uh, some people act like time's unlimited and uh, never ending and time's an opportunity to develop interpersonal relationships, which is a good thing to, to note. Uh, power distance. Uh, compare societies based on how far the less powerful members of organizations ex uh, accept an unequal distribution of power. Subordinates, if you're in a supervisory position, expect hierarchies, embrace that. You're going to be working with far people. We're going to have supervision. 
and how you relate to them uh, has a lot to do with your career uh, and how well you're going to do in the future. So I encourage you to think through these concepts that you find in your book. Uh, technology and social media, how they affect intercultural communications is important. Uh, it can be a bridge. It can also be a hindrance. Uh, and global business will always have technology to a varying degree. And you'll, you'll sit in, in these meetings with uh, people from around the world. So uh, you, you have to be very careful that you're not offensive in what you say. Uh, we tend to be very parochial as Americans. Uh, we tend to have an attitude that we're superior work for a German company, they also felt the same way that you had to learn to think like a German. But there is a certain truth to that. You need to lear learn to think uh, based upon the environment that you are around. And so it's, it's of vital importance. So social networking is a great way to kind of erase this cultural difference uh, that some of those are regional and cultural. Uh, you know, even in this country, uh, you know, if you're from West Virginia, I'm from South Carolina, most people would judge us coming from those two states as being kind of backwoods and kind of rural and rustic, and we have an accent and we don't use proper English and all those things. You want to erase as much of those differences as possible because people tend to uh, tend to judge you by those, and it's not always a it's not always a good thing. So you basically work on changing that. The fifth and the last objective is to discuss strategies to help us to overcome these, uh, these native cultures and negative attitudes that prevent miscommunication, and that's, that's important. Uh, improving intercultural effectiveness, practice empathy, uh, feel for pe other people that are having the same problems that you are. Understand that we can sometimes generalize or stereotype people in ways that uh, is negative. Stay open-minded, build cultural awareness, and, you know, kind of get rid of this uh, ethnocentrism of you're the only, you know, your way is the right way and the way Americans do it. Don't make those statements in an international context, by the way. Well, the way we do this in America is this. You're basically uh, stereotyping and saying that, uh, you know, what we do is right, what you do is wrong, uh, and they may just, they understand it in different ways. Uh, in a, in a, intercultural oral communication, use simple English, speak and enunciate clearly, but don't give that attitude that you're doing that, uh, and then encourage you know, them for, for understanding and feedback. Uh, don't interrupt. One of the major listening skills you have to learn is not to be thinking about your response while someone else is, was speaking. Try to understand them first, then take a moment and kind of collect your thoughts and, you know, uh, do eye contact, smile, you know, accept blame when you're wrong, follow up in writing, always confirm, you know, what went on in the meeting, uh, consider, you know, all kinds of these things about ambiguous wording. Uh, you've got to realize one of the things that you are very careful not to do, and that is you do not uh, tell jokes in meetings because people have different sensibilities what is offensive to them may be different than what's offensive to you. So it's just a good practice. Don't joke. And uh, be careful using euphemisms that are, are um, you know, unique to Americans. I, I was traveling with a Filipino group and things like hit the road or shake a leg. They have no translation in their language. And so they take it quite literally. And that's very important. Uh, we need to think about globalization, workplace diversity, uh, and our workplace is becoming more and more diverse as we, as we go along. Think about all these different things that come under diversity, ethnicity, age, gender, religion, race, national origin, sexual orientation, physical abilities. Uh, you may not agree with someone's life choices, but you do have to work with them and you do have to treat them with respect. This is how uh, the growth has come as far as diversity. Uh, here are white non-Hispanics between, you know, into the 70s, see how much they've grown. Uh, Hispanics, look at the growth there. African-Americans have pretty well stayed the same. And Asians and Pacific Islanders have grown somewhat. So you see that there are different groups 
coming in. So basically growing workforce diversity uh, is better able to respond to a, a global work base uh, or you know, customers and you have team members with various experiences, uh, they can come up and, and work so much better together when they working off their differences is very helpful. So how do you, uh, you know, communicate with diverse audiences? Seek training, training is always a good thing. Uh, understand the value of differences, learn about your cultural self, make fewer assumptions and then build on similarities and those things will help you help you greatly. So as an introduction, hopefully this will, uh, you know, get you started in the textbook for chapter one, uh, and we will do three more chapters each week. So basically, thank you for listening, and uh, I look forward to uh, to to talking to you again uh, to again soon. Thanks.